We have here a Lutheran scholar who is a Presbyterian serving in a United Methodist related seminary presenting our fall faculty lecture following a sabbatical working in Scotland and Germany and how jealous can any of us get of that. <laughs> His research focused on a project titled From Luther to Lutheranism, Architects of Church Order in 16th Century North Germany. While in Scotland at St. Andrews University, Dr. James was the Cameron Faculty Fellow at the Reformation Studies Institute. In Germany, he was at the Herzog August Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel. Dr. James's, Dr. James consulted texts and prints regarding church orders or Kirchen Ordnungen in North Germany during the 16th century, also studying territorial geographical maps to assess dimensions of reform. Dr. James hopes to publish his work prior to the 500th anniversary of the Reformation in the fall of 2017. And you may know his credentials, but I'm going to put them out there for you again for your memorization. He earned his PhD at The Ohio State University in 1993 with a dissertation titled Ordo at Libertas, Church Discipline and the Social Vision of the Makers of Church Order in 16th Century Northern Germany. My sense is that Jeff does not leave Germany. <laughs> He arrived at MTSO in 1992 and spent several years as an administrator, assistant dean from 1996 to 1999, and interim academic dean 2002 to 2004. And as I've already said, he is Presbyterian, also an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA. We are really looking forward to hearing your work today, Dr. James. I do want to uh, begin by saying um, thanks to you, uh, Dean Withrow, for the introduction and uh, to colleagues and friends. Um, having a time of extended research leave is a gift I do not take for granted. Um, the opportunity to travel and do this kind of work is um, not as common as one might find even in more uh, perhaps one should say prestigious academic institutions. So uh, I'm grateful not only to us as a community here, but to the Board of Trustees that makes those kinds of things um, possible. It's never uh, fun to be away for a long time, uh, away from one's community and especially from one's spouse. And uh, I was reminded of that every day during Skype time, which took place at lunch from noon to about 1230, so um, that Skype was a good thing. Uh, I'm going to work primarily with um, a, a script, a, a text that I have, but I'll, I'll deviate from it a little bit. I've got a few slides that we're going to take a look at. Um, I'll note that um, sometimes I, I find more comfort in some parts of the media world that I inhabit, and and usually that's early modern printed books. <laughs> so technology isn't always a part of that, and actually I'd really rather work with manuscripts. So, and this project has involved all of those things, as we will um, see as I, I proceed forward. Uh, so in 1532, Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, and other Wittenberg colleagues returned a recently drafted church ordinance, or a Kirchen Ordnung, to the leaders of the imperial city of Nuremberg. Overall, they were pleased with the document that was later printed in the city here, and offered these observations as it returned the draft. For although the events of the present are occurring everywhere so rapidly that church orders cannot be drawn up and instituted everywhere as quickly as necessary, nevertheless one must still heed pure teaching along with external Christian discipline and behavior and guard against much injustice, seeking daily to improve on the situation until the Almighty grants more peace and unity in ecclesiastical and secular governments. Clearly, these reformers themselves were alarmed at how quickly changes were occurring. They were especially concerned to balance matters of religious freedom, justice, order, 
and discipline, never an easy task. Church orders are what I've called in this lecture title church manuals, or more technically, you've heard the title a couple, or the phrase a couple of times, Kirchen Ordnungen, were to be instituted for this very person and a purpose, and according to these theologians, could not be drawn up and disseminated quickly enough. These documents were part of an avalanche of printed literature that appeared by the end of the 16th century, and obviously this is the focus of my lecture today. In particular, I want to probe their unique contribution to the larger world of print during the early modern era. I will begin by setting a context and updating some of what scholars have for at least the past four decades termed the so-called printing revolution. Initially, their analysis of print culture centered on controversial or polemical literature, what we would call propaganda. But more recently, print historians have been addressing the vast array of printed materials that followed the introduction of the printing press and especially movable type to the Western world. The first media stars of the Reformation movements, both Protestant and Roman Catholic, spun their arguments for an increasingly literate public drawing heavily on this fairly recent innovation. These church manuals, these Kirchenordnungen, are but one example of the other kind of literature, not polemical, less flashy, less highly charged, more mundane, but essential for building the broader confessional culture that characterized Germany in particular during the second half of the 16th century. Once I've surveyed these wider dimensions of print culture, I want to consider the place of these particular documents, the Kirchen Ordnungen. After general comments describing them, I want to give you some feel for what they are, uh, I will concentrate on the documents that are at the heart of my research project, the numerous Kirchen Ordnungen published from northern Germany in the late 16th century, really mid to late. The earliest of these appeared in 1527, with nearly 50 printed by the end of the 16th century. They were prepared for imperial and territorial cities, the former jurisdictions of residential bishops, and an array of smaller and larger principalities. Some were fairly short pamphlets, while others emerged as elaborate and lengthy statements of territorial religious policy. Presenting a few of these ordinances, one for territorial Saxony, one for the city of Braunschweig, and one for the electorate of Brandenburg, will provide a closer look at the intersection of printed material and content. It's my hope that by exploring the published dimensions of these documents, we will gain a better grasp of their place within the social, the religious, and the political fabric of the early modern world. As I noted, I, I want to begin with some re-familiarization of what the introduction of print meant to the early modern world. One of the first uh, really impactful studies of printing uh, was done by uh, the writer Elizabeth Eisenstein, who published her still influential The Printing Press as an Agent of Change in 1979. Eisenstein built on the earlier work of French historians Lucien Favre and uh, Henri Jean Martin, whose uh, Les Apparitions du Livre, The Coming of the Book, first explored the role or creation of an early modern print culture. Eisenstein's subsequent The Printing Revolution in Early Modern Europe popularized the notion and secured the nomenclature that has described this phenomenon. I don't have the time here to explore all of the intrigue of this rather fascinating story, and it's worth hearing again. Uh, the migration of the technology from the East, China, the Arabic world, uh, the, popular, uh, the particular innovation that developed as the printing press and movable type, and the contested role of the principal players, uh, Johann Gutenberg and his rivals. However, from roughly 1450 to 1500, print exploded in Western Europe, with nearly 50,000 printed volumes available by the end of the century. We know, of course, about Gutenberg's famous Bible. Most books, called incunabula, were scholarly classics, primarily printed in Latin, 
but increasingly in vernacular languages, English, German, French, Italian, Spanish, Polish, and an array of other contemporary languages. The table over here, I'm going to talk about it at the end. Uh, it's my little show and tell part. Um, features one of my favorite books, the Nuremberg Chronicle, published in 1493 in uh, what's called duo size. That's almost folio. Folio would be a whole page folded in half to duo, folded again to quarto, folded again to octavo. So print kind of descending in that way. Uh, but along with Bibles, loads of other literature, religious literature, uh, notably books of hours and prayer books, uh, appeared during the 15th century. And even some of the very first forms, usually published as single sheets, or what scholars call broadsheets or broadsides, of the single sheets surviving from the 15th century, nearly a third of them are indulgences. That's what we have left. The reference to indulgences leads us naturally to the reformer Martin Luther. While his contemporary Erasmus was probably the first person who could survive, better yet, thrive, on the proceeds from his publications, Luther rather quickly dominated the printing, dominated the printing market in Germany. His first brief publication appeared in 1516. Then the lightning rod dissemination of the 95 Theses in 1517, and the following year, 18 pamphlets, small works, but widely distributed. And he continued to publish multitudes of volumes over the remaining years of his life, dying in 1546. His 1520, uh, 1520 tract to the Christian nobility of the German nation had an initial press run of 4,000 copies nearly five times a normal press run, and it sold out in five days. Wittenberg, with its fairly new university, became an instant pub a printing hub and continued to dominate the German trade, the so-called home of printing, through the end of the 16th century. The 16th century was not our relatively tolerant era with good-natured Pope Francis I traveling about the United States, attracting admiration from both Protestants and Roman Catholics, well, at least maybe until the last couple of days. <laughs> Many, but not all, of Luther's pamphlets were weapons he wielded against what he typically regarded as demonic opponents, incarnate in the form of the papacy, Turks, Misguided contemporaries he labeled, labeled as schwärmer, which means kind of people with bees flowing around, floating around in their heads, uh, and sadly, Jews. Even Luther's Bible featured an image of one of these, uh, one of the hideous beasts of St. John's Apocalypse with its rider wearing the triple tiara. You can see it there a not-so-subtle direct allusion to the papacy. It's interesting that this um, image uh, appeared for the first time just like this in September of 1523 when Luther did his translation of the scripture of the New Testament into German. It um, quickly was censored and disappeared. They changed the image. And the later, the so-called December Testament of 1523, but this is now 1534, and all bets are off, and they don't care anymore. So back to the uh, polemic of print. Uh, these attacks were not one-sided, and Luther's opponents launched, uh, launched their literary assault as well. Uh, this familiar woodcut um, is of a, a, a pamphlet, uh, really a scandalous biography, uh, of uh, Luther the Reformer by Johann Cochleus, the so-called seven-headed Luther. Um, overall, these polemical tracts fueled the early stages of reform with other printing centers, Zurich, Geneva, and by the time of Elizabeth I, London, broadening its confessional configuration. Not surprisingly, a host of studies have investigated this swath of controversial literature targeted to audi audiences both learned and lay. And I'm not going to read through these titles, but you can kind of note. Um, I just, this is just a little sampling of 
books in English that have the word propaganda from the last couple of decades. Of course, printing was not dominated entirely by doctrinal barbs and ad hominem attacks. There were scads of other published sources, and thanks to an important project hosted by the University of St. Andrews, we know more than ever before about the breadth of printed culture in the early modern world. St. Andrews is the current home to the International Short Title Catalog Project funded by a mammoth grant from uh, what the, in the United Kingdom is the equivalent of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Essentially, the group is putting together a massive searchable database of everything printed from 1450 to 1600. The project began with French books as scholars from St. Andrews scoured regional archives and local libraries to search out books that were not to be found in more prestigious and well-known collections. The founder and director of the project is the early modern historian Andrew Pedigree, and I'm drawing on some of my comments, uh, I'm drawing some of my comments uh, from his work, and it's this book right over here, uh, The Book in the Renaissance. It was published by Yale uh, in 2010. Uh, one little sidebar comment. Um, I arrived in St. Andrews um, in uh, kind of the, the middle point of uh, September last year. Um, spent my first day kind of roaming around Edinburgh before going up to uh, St. Andrews. And this was about five days before the Scottish referendum on independence. Uh, so as I roamed around uh, Edinburgh that day, I got one of these pamphlets on yes. The yes vote was to pull out of the UK and go independent. And then the opposing campaign was better together. And uh, so this played out while I was there. Um, I had uh, just a brief meeting when I first arrived with Professor Pedigree, with Andrew, who I've known for some time. And um, this was Tuesday. And I've never seen him look so horrible. He was ashen. And um, this huge grant that he had, and he's a Brit too, was from, uh, from the UK. And I think he was looking at his possible, this whole thing that he built just disappearing. Um, I watched election returns, not with him, but kind of thinking of him on Thursday night. And it was kind of a little bit up for grabs at first. And eventually, it went down and had lunch with him the day after. A completely changed person. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, interesting to be there for that. Uh, the, the particular interest uh, of this project is to assess, for them, the full array of printed literature from the period with some special attention to what Pedigree calls the grubby small books that made up the bulk of production. Perhaps what we have here is an attempt to probe one of the earliest expressions of a consumer culture that produced items for quick consumption and disposal, which was rather different from the treasured status of books in particular throughout the Middle Ages. So it's an interesting kind of um, dynamic that's at work here, that, that now we have books being produced really for not just consumption, but uh, for throwing them away. Uh, with this background in mind, we come now to my topic and the documents of my research, these manuals, these ordinances, Kirchen Ordnungen of the mid to late 16th century. Uh, generally, these were not the kind of throwaway books I've just described, but they were part of the more mundane literature that accompanied the period of reform. So a significant part of my work this past year was to work on these pamphlets, drawing on the latest understanding of early modern print culture. In the fall, we've already, I've already mentioned, or at least or, uh, Dean Withrow mentioned, I was in residence in St. Andrews, uh, working in particular with many of the staff members of the ISTC project. A part of my time in St. Andrews was looking to locate these particular documents, these Kirchen Ordnungen, in the early modern printed culture. Part two of my leave uh, involved working more directly with the actual printed materials. And I've got a couple of examples here that I've borrowed from uh, the Lutheran Seminary, from Trinity Lutheran. I'll show you those um, towards the end. Um, 
Uh, and uh, the place that I work, the Herzog Auguste Bibliothèque in Wolfenbüttel, uh, it has really one of the largest collections of 16th and 17th century uh, prints, um, German prints, of any place in the world. And all of this is part of a broader project looking at the process of writing and adop adopting these church ordinances. And uh, I was going to kind of say a little bit more about the, the larger book, but I think I'm going to hold off on that. Um, I will not, I've just got one map in this presentation. This is kind of a 16th century map of northern Germany done by the uh, uh, cosmographer uh, Sebastian Munster, who is also one of the great Hebraists, uh, worked with the uh, uh, Hebrew, um, other um, biblical languages. And uh, so you see a little bit. So this is kind of what I'm looking at. I'm going to mention Brauns uh, Brunswick or Braunschweig a little bit later on. Uh, here's Wittenberg here. Uh, this is kind of an upside down map, which is not, you know, totally un So actually, south is at the top here, and this is the Baltic Sea here. Um, Hamburg, which you maybe can kind of pick out. So a little bit of a feel for my race. So I'm looking primarily at northern Germany. And then this would be a more contemporary map, but I won't uh, kind of go through this. Some of these slides I swiped. I, I did a piece of this lecture, a different version, uh, when I was in Germany, uh, in German. Uh, it, it, it went okay. <laughs> it, it's always, uh, that's always a, a journey. Um, so just a little bit on content. Uh, these are rich and complex documents. They cover uh, matters of faith and belief and sometimes contained uh, abbreviated confessions and catechisms. Usually folks like to kind of divide them up into uh, Credenda would be kind of the confessional dimension, agenda, agenda would be kind of the liturgical dimension, and administranda is probably self-evident. That has to do with the way we kind of organize, not just the church, but for them, broader arena, as I'll mention in a minute. So um, often the term Kirchenordnung was used uh, to refer directly to a liturgy. Uh, here's one here. Um, so this is uh, a Saxon document, a Kirchenordnung or agenda with musical notation, uh, as the Germans would say, und so weiter, uh, et cetera. Uh, connected in there. Um, so these liturgies with introits, prefaces, colics, and sometimes musical notation covering an array of festival days in normal weekly worship. And they addressed a variety of civil and religious concerns, like the organization of schools and staffs, visiting the sick, burying the dead, training midwives, administering poor relief uh, through numerous um, community poor relief ordinances. So um, they're interesting. They're complex and they're broad. And of course, these church orders were quickly, uh, very quickly entered the world of print. As statements of territorial or religious policy, they had a certain legal status. They were also designed as pastoral aids for liturgy and preaching. In several instances, orders were required possessions of churches or clergy. In analyzing the printed church ordinances that circulated in northern Germany, my interest, uh, I've had several basic questions in mind. Some of, these are some of these concerns are summarized uh, on a sheet that um, I'm going to put up at the end, so I don't have to kind of search it out right now. Um, but it didn't fit well in the uh, PowerPoint, so it's more complex than that. Uh, so one set of questions involves initial pr uh, production, location, printer, style, uh, size. Uh, printing of church orders was generally dispersed through this period. Wittenberg, not surprisingly, was an important early center. Likewise, Magdeburg, Lübeck, some of these other uh, cities in the region. Uh, several later orders were produced in Marburg, which kind of later has a history as a reform city. Leipzig, Erfurt, Eisleben, so there's an array of these places. Uh, in addition, I'm interested in the visual impact of the order, with, it, with particular attention to the, the title page. And we're going to see some of these here in a minute. Uh, what do these initial images and statements reveal regarding the content and intent of the church order? Uh, many orders provided territorial insignia. Others had representations of biblical events. And a few even had images analogous to the keys of the Roman church. So again, this analysis of visual components can provide some insights into the diverse contribution of these documents, these church ordinances. Uh, looking at a few of these will uh, make these uh, concerns a little more concrete. So now um, we're going to take a look at a few of these. Although not the first, uh, 
Philip Melanchthon's 1528 Saxon church order called the Unterricht der Visitatoren, that's what's here, um, or the instruction for the visitors of parish clergy, which had a preface by Luther, was a particularly influential document. It was not the first, but widely dis distributed. Uh, this Saxon instruction uh, was not the first to be written by Melanchthon. He had a series of articles uh, that preceded it in 1527. Uh, and in 1527, uh, the printer, Nicholas Schulentz, published without Melanchthon's permission, and this happened then, maybe kind of like it happens now, but maybe more than now, where people are literally from some of these reforms. This happens to Luther all the time. People are writing down what he's saying and publishing this without his so-called permission. So this kind of appears in that way um, in Latin uh, in 1527. Uh, a second edition um, from Scholenz and an edition published uh, by um, a printer in Basel, uh, Johann Froben, who published a lot of Erasmus's works, uh, presented Melanchthon's proposals to a dispersed and divergent theological community, which included um, Erasmus. Uh, the revised German articles, which were subsequently published by uh, Schulenz, and I've actually got the Weimar edition kind of of these up here, and I'll show those to you a little bit uh, later. It resulted from November meetings with the Saxon print and his court at Torgau, but in no way compromised uh, some of Melanchthon's fundamental theological positions, and one of these was on penance, which you can imagine was a hotly debated topic for them. Uh, this document, the Unterricht, was a longer, more comprehensive document than the earlier articles. It was about 44 quarto leaves. So think of the front and back. That's the way they usually kind of, or typically print scholars talk about this. The, they don't talk about pages, but, but leaves front and back, um, as opposed to 18 uh, in the, the articles that we saw just a minute ago. And it was reissued. Uh, and this is interesting to me, but I'll just kind of skip through these. But I want you to see these images of the numerous um, subsequent editions, different printers, some of them white in, in Wittenberg, others kind of scattered about as this same document is reissued with different kind of styles, some more elaborate, as I had at the beginning, some uh, fairly simple here at the end. Uh, for the most part, these instructions should be classified really more as a theological statement, a guide to preaching with a pronounced catechetical orientation than as a statement of territorial policies. That's one of the debates in this, you know, to what degree are these really state documents and to what degree are they more pastoral aids? And there's tension that exists there between those. Uh, the title page for Sri 1528 edition reinforces this more pastoral intent with a Trinitarian image at the top. You can kind of pick out a little bit of that, see the spirit for, sir, for certain. Uh, the prophets Moses and John flanking the title of the tract. Um, although the names of the reformers are not specifically uh, mentioned, uh, crests of Melanchthon and Luther appear at the bottom. So this is the typical kind of Luther crest, if you can kind of see it with the kind of its uh, a, a lily with a, a cross and a heart inside of it, and then this is Melanchthon, kind of almost looks like the physicians, kind of the, the serpent on, on the cross kind of thing, which uh, Melanchthon was one of the kind of, uh, a scholar of many, uh, many capabilities. Uh, a reprint of this book in 1538 by the printer Hans Luft, um, we'll jump to this one, kind of a series here. Um, included not just uh, Luther and Melanchthon, but several others, and I'm, I think I'm going to move away from this and, and, and not go into this, because I want to give you a little bit of time. I want to talk about these. But I do want to note this. So um, here's this particular document reprinted. Now, this is not going to quite get us, but I'll, I'll kind of do some translate of the way that um, various titles now appear for the same document. So the first one says, um, instruction to uh, the parish visitors uh, in Electoral Saxony. Um, 
that's been corrected by Martin Luther, 1538. Now, it's not actually um, for Electoral Saxony. This is now appearing in neighboring Albertine Saxony, so, uh, which formerly was staunchly Roman Catholic, but the Duke, Duke Heinrich, uh, converts, and so it changes. So the second time it appears, they recognize that. So this is now the instruction to the parish visitor, visitors in Duke Heinrich's uh, duchy of Saxony. So the, a little change there. And then a third one uh, says, uh, instruction of the visitors uh, in Duke Heinrich's um, uh, duchy uh, in the same form that it appeared in this one. So they're, they're constantly kind of shifting the nomenclature and the title to kind of make sure that people know they're still getting the same thing, but it's been corrected. And uh, I'm going to note at least one of those corrections, I think, here. Uh, in a bit. Yeah, I'll mention it here. So, um, so even though the, the title uh, page was um, corrected, there, there were these um, additions. Um, and I've kind of just moved away from my little thing where I wanted to explain the corrections. Well, I'll just tell you. What, one of the things that he changes, I mean, this time Luther says, uh, well, we made some concessions before, and the gig's up. We're not doing this anymore. And one of the concessions that they made was uh, for people who were so-called weak in faith, they would allow them to receive communion in, t in one kind. So you can imagine, this is the 16th century. For some folk, you know, we might say, for the older members, change was hard. You know, the, you know we don't like that kind of music. Uh, for them, it was, we don't want communion in two, in two kinds. And now. Luther's going to kind of rebut a concession made earlier in this church ordinance and say, we're not going to let you do this anymore. And part of the reason, oh, this comes later, uh, is because they printed it for a while. So I'll come back to that. So um, now I want to skip to uh, just one other one to talk about for a bit here. So uh, it was often difficult to retain the simple instructional framework of the, of the Saxon document that I've just taken a look at. Uh, although a few church orders were actually shorter, most tended to be longer. So no surprise there, they get increasingly longer and more comprehensive. Uh, the order that uh, John Bubenhagen, who was one of Luther's associates in Wittenberg, uh, composed for the city of Braunschweig in 1528, immediately after the publication of the Saxon order, illustrates this fairly effectively. This order for Braunschweig was one of several issued, especially in the decades of the late 1520s, 30s, and 40s, for North German cities. Uh, most of them were a part of the so-called Hanseatic League, uh, when uh, Tim Ben Meter and, and Diane Labodi went up to um, uh, some of the, the cities along the Baltic, in particular Tallinn. Tallinn was a member of the, of the Hansa League, so had a German kind of community that was uh, connected to it as well. So lots of these documents fan out in these regions. So building on arguments that uh, Bubenhagen had written in an earlier tract, he emphasized that three things were necessary for good reform, good schools, trained preachers, and a community chest. And this is going to become a refrain through many of these, that you need these three elements, and in particular in these um, orders from Bugenhagen. Uh, he challenged the criticism that he was introducing a new order by insisting that he advocated only minimal and necessary changes. And his order merely restated what Christ and the Apostle Paul had already instituted. The order in its original low German edition contained 140 octavo leaves. So I mentioned that those early articles, 18, Melanchthon, Luther's, Unterricht, 44, now we're up to 140. And Rubenhagen says, apologizing for its length, that this is mostly because he needs to develop an understanding of the sacraments. So this is 1528 when a lot of this controversy is swirling around um, how do we understand the Lord's Supper? So there's a huge segment in this church document, or this church ordinance, on the nature of the Eucharist. Several of these initial orders followed the lead of the Saxon instructions, 
in recognizing the person or persons most responsible for composing the order. Uh, Bugenhagen's published orders for uh, Braunschweig, the one that was just up there, this one for Lubeck, there's his name. So initially, I'm going to shorten this too, names of these folk are appearing on these documents. So you've got Bugenhagen mentioned on a couple of these. Uh, a later a reformer, Antonius Corvinus, his name appears on this one uh, for the city of Nordheim. Uh, this one is written by a, a person uh, named Gerrit Olmeken, but um, it's also reviewed by another reformer. So they're kind of front and center ways to um, represent these folk. And then another um, other reformer, Hermann Bonus, is kind of noted in this one for Osnabrück. Different for this one. This is for a territory. The other ones that I just noted were for cities. So there's, there's sometimes distinction around that. Contrast here, though, would be uh, a 1540 a document written for Elector of Brandenburg, so sandwiched between the last two that I just showed, with no mention of rather prominent individuals that are involved in drafting these documents. So one of the questions I'm kind of working with is, what, when do they put an author's name on this title page and why? Um, and so that's kind of a, a question in process still, too. I mean. Some would have said, and that's what, where kind of that one example becomes an outlier, uh, that the ones that, that get um, names on them typically are city ordinances as opposed to territorial. So um, some of those kinds of dimensions. Okay, uh, pick up here. Um, despite the fact that critical theological perspectives featured prominently in later territorial ordinances, these documents lost the focused instructional and pastoral elements that were often characteristic of the Saxon Unterricht, the first one I was talking about, and several of the other earlier ones. So they kind of change in status from kind of outlines of doctrine and ideas and some practices to now more elaborate expressions of what one might begin to term church law for them. Uh, these changes were not only evident in the content of the order, but in their, in their structure and appearance as well. Um, and I'm going to just breeze through uh, three of these. This one, Mecklenburg, 1552, very territorial in its structure and in its appearance as it comes out. Uh, this one for uh, a larger territory in northern Germany, uh, where that city of Braunschweig is uh, in um, it's the territory of uh, what later will be the Hanoverian territory, but it's called uh, Braunschweig Wolfenbüttel in 1569, with the name of the Duke on here, um, not the name of any of the reformers. And likewise, then, this uh, one that appears towards the end of the 16th century, uh, published again in Wittenberg. Um, oh, no, this one's in Leipzig, but there's another edition that um, is printed in Wittenberg, and it is a book like this. Say, wow. So here's the change. You start with this, you end with this, in, in a span of about 60 years. So those are questions that I'm beginning to try to pull together. Well, what is this saying about these? I mean, obviously, you can write a whole lot more in something like that, but what begins to appear, and how do we uh, analyze and assess those things. And I'm going to spend just a minute with this, and then we'll kind of uh, conclude. Um, a second consideration that um, I'd like to address is the rationale given for printing these documents. Why, why print them? Many circulate or, or don't circulate, but many are, are drafted as manuscripts, and they remain in archives. You know, they're a part of the prince's court. They're a part of the city archive. They're kind of drafted, but not printed and disseminated. So why print some and not others? Uh, almost immediately, critics alleged that the uh, church ordinances violated the religious freedom so often championed by the reformers and were simply a return to papal laws that they had abandoned, uh, that they had already abandoned. Uh, in drafting their instructions, Luther and Melanchthon were attentive to these criticisms. They countered that while the Pope's decretals, that's, the, that's kind of the we don't want to be that. We don't want to be canon law. We don't want to go back there. 
uh, that while the Pope's decretals or canon law remained in darkness, their ordinances were publicly available in print and were not binding on the consciences, consciences of the faithful or individual believers. So that's one of the reasons they're arguing. We print these to make them public. Uh, another German reformer, Urbanus Regius, uh, extended this argument about the public value of these documents in a very lengthy introduction he wrote for the uh, Church Order of Hanover. Uh, in this introduction, which was three times as long as the order, I mean, it's fascinating. It, it's got a whole retelling of church history with lots of stuff about heretics, which is kind of fun to read. And part of what he's trying to do is unravel charges that they are the heretics. Because technically now, they are. Because they're, they're all illegal. Um, they're you know, kind of operating as religious folk without formal religious sanction until 1555 when there's a game change for them. But so they're trying to defend these things, as was the case here uh, in Hanover. Uh, so Regius argued above all for the legitimacy of what, was, what he was proposing for the city of Hanover. In a fairly uh, typical defense of what he regarded as the true church, always a factor, he insisted that both a public confession of faith and a subsequent public distribution of that confession in print helped to ensure its legitimacy. In principle, publicly confessed and given in print. That's what they argued. Uh, this applied not only to the previously published Augsburg Confession, the, the be-all, end-all for the Lutheran Reformation. Just go down to Trinity, talk to the folks. It's all about the Augsburg Confession or the Confessio Augustana. But it also applied uh, to these mo more localized confessions, like this one that Regius had drafted for the religious community of Hanover. So printing and public dissemination served to validate their teaching providing an important context for confirmation. Uh, printing a church order also provided a basis for comparison and for making either corrections or perhaps improvements. Uh, the church order for Bremen, uh, drafted primarily by uh, Johann Thiemann, emphasizes, emphasized precisely this point. Uh, and he argued, um, noting changes in neighboring Hamburg and Lübeck, that the order emphasized that, quote, we remain in consort, the same with other evangelical cities, in ceremonies, in faith, in order to provide unity across our congregation. So not surprisingly, just about to the conclusion, printing church ordinances encouraged widespread borrowing of paragraphs in various sections. These become the first kind of cut and paste documents, uh, but in a way that's kind of contextualizing reform, as it, you know, so they're, they're picking and choosing what they're going to do. Uh, Bubenhagen's order for Braunschweig drew heavily on the Saxon instructions that I mentioned before, especially in the discussion of school curriculum that was attributed to Melanchthon, so the lengthy, um, the whole, this is a whole other topic, but uh, really interesting detailed things now are argued about public education and where it comes from. And there's been lots of attention to that, as well as to poor relief, because these become kind of for uh, kind of social welfare, uh, education, and community relief. These are um, pivotal early modern documents. Uh, so borrowing from this, uh, for additional explanations, Bugenhagen told his readers to consult the instructions directly. In turn, the church order for Göttingen uh, expected readers to use um, Bugenhagen's order for Braunschweig. Uh, the wide circulation of the Brandenburg-Nuremberg order, this is the one I started with, was cited throughout northern Germany, and Brandenburg-Nuremberg is down kind of in the south central area. So with that, just a little bit of conclusion, preliminary. So in conclusion, this analysis has provided a chance to consider these important manuals or church orders as part of the broader dimensions of the early world of print. Looking carefully at aspects of printing helps us to appreciate the localized and very contextual dimensions of the Reformation as it was implemented in the cities and territories in Germany. Here, too, we encounter the challenges and perhaps impossibility of reformers retaining lofty dimensions of Christian freedom, especially in regard to expressions of public worship and ceremonies.
print facilitated borrowing and enabled a wider interchange of, interchange of forms and concepts. It also, at times, prompted greater commitments to uniformity that curtailed diversity of expression and allowed enforcement to assume an ever-increasing role in some aspects of early modern religious life. 